Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. This snappy little show is called Double Feature. Mm-hmm. And the one bringing the snap today is Michael Kester. Yeah, I'm going to snap all over. Are you ready to bring the snap yeah, today? Yeah, I'm about to snap. So we got, a, as usual, a weird show. We used to do shows that were just easy and yeah. fun. But now we feel the need to personally challenge ourselves for some reason. Mm-hmm. And today we have a double feature that I guess is examining films based on pseudoscience. Yeah. But this is going to be a hard one because I know a lot of people who listen to the show are... I think, by and large, skeptically minded. Mm -hmm. And so some of them might be pissed off that we're doing these two movies this week. Yeah. Uh, Some of them might actually be the versions of ourselves from year one of this show Mm -hmm. that would be pissed. We would be pissed off if, if, say, our producer in year one had made us do The Exorcism of Emily Rose and The Fourth Kind. Would we be upset by that? Probably. We would have been upset by that. Maybe a little bit. And I understand that because it's pseudoscience. And when you watch films about pseudoscience, which is uh, things that masquerade as science but are not science, instead they're bullshit, then you sort of feel like you're embracing that a little bit. And I don't think that's happening. I'm not embracing it. Neither am I. Because of the Rebecca Watson clips have not shown our hand, we're both skeptics. We're both yeah. pretty big fans of science. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think we're doing these shows today not so much to debunk them, because, the, I mean, it's just obvious. You believe in this Work's nonsense. Work's done for us. Right. Right. It's exorcism and aliens that we're talking about today. So not so much to debunk them, but these films also happen to bring up some pretty uncomfortable questions. Maybe uncomfortable because they're about the, the topics they're about. Right. So we're going to uh, do less of our science champion stuff today mm-hmm. and more of the, the job the producer wants us to come in the studio and do, which is talk about goddamn movies. Yep. All right, show me how snappy you can get through the next segment of what we usually do with the show. Well, you haven't even asked me what films we're doing yet. What are the films on the... <laughs> do I have to ask you every fucking week, what movies are we doing? Uh, this time we're going to do The Exorcism of Emily Rose and The Fourth Kind. People already know that. They I saw know, the title it, of the, the show. The title, there's, a, there's artwork. I don't even know why we bother saying it. We should just let it, let it slide every time. Uh, we're going to spoil the films. There's chapters to skip the spoilers. And if you get too angry hearing us talk about exorcism or we're on your side on this one, this shit does not exist. But uh, if it makes you angry, I don't want people to be angry. Just skip to the thing or what we're doing. We almost got we're coming up on number 150, another great arbitrary number we can celebrate. Yeah, we have. That's a number of shows we've done. Yes, it certainly is. There will be anyway. So we'll talk about that next time. Uh, That makes the first film, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. That's right. A movie starring, of course, the great Jennifer Carpenter. That's true. This is, I guess this is her first major film. Yeah, well, this is kind of where she came from. Appar- everybody that had seen this film, which is apparently everyone I know. Except uh, me. That's, right. It was exactly. one of those again. So, 2005, right? I wasn't watching yeah. horror movies back then. When I, was, when I was watching, when I started watching the show Dexter, where she is a huge character on, right. everybody said, hey, that's Emily Rose. And I was like, <laughs> you know, that I don't know who the fuck that is. Yeah. And now I know. I mean, I've, now I've seen The Exorcist. She's got the, the movie's named after her. That's a big deal, right? It is a big deal. And she won some Scream Award MTV oh, really? thing or what. I don't know what that even means. But uh, she's pretty fucking good in she's it. She's really good. Um, a lot of the movie just revolves around her agony. It's weird to see her in, you know, Quarantine came out a couple years ago, which I still haven't seen. But it's, mm-hmm. you know, the English it's remake, REC, REC in America. thing, whatever. And we covered REC on the show. Protagonist of REC, by the way, who we also credited as, as being awesome, mm-hmm. as being really great there. And so by proxy, I don't know, let's just credit Jennifer Carpenter as being great. But she does a lot of horror stuff outside of Dexter. I guess mm-hmm. Dexter could be... Cl- Dexter's too poppy to be horror, it's, right? It's too Miami to be horror. There's too much CSI going on there. But Jennifer Carpenter's really good at, I guess, not just the Scream Queen stuff, but different takes on those roles. You know, we see her all throughout The Exorcism of Emily Rose just being tortured and tormented. And creepy. And creepy, yeah. She has to kind of pull off some of the stuff we talked about way back, mm-hmm. the stuff I railed against at the time, season one Eric, year one Eric. Uh, about exorcism stuff and using creepy voices that are very much still her voice, but uh, making these weird contortions and the looks she gives, and it's all just really performance heavy. And then acting across from Tom Wilkinson. Mm -hmm. So if you want to ask a question, like why is Double Feature doing these movies on the show? All you need to say to get me to see a movie is Jennifer Carpenter is a crazy person 
and Tom Wilkinson is trying to beat the crazy out of her. I mean, it's kind of like Black Snake Moan. Yeah. Christina Ricci is a crazy person, and Samuel L. Jackson is trying to beat the crazy out of her. Yeah. Right. And there, I see the movie. That's sure. all it takes. Yep. And so Tom Wilkinson, I mean, we saw him earlier on the show when we did Eternal Sunshine of yeah, the Spotless Mind. Yeah, that's right. I Mind. forgot about that. He was also in Batman Begins around the yeah, same that's, time. Yeah, see, that's that for happened. some reason. That's why I know him. That's that's the role I remember him most from, even though he's barely in that. He's good in it. He has a great little chunk in it. He's also a little crazy in Michael Clayton, which is all that needs to be said about Michael Clayton on Double Feature, at least for the time being. So those two kind of speak for themselves. The riddle comes with Laura Linney's character. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, Laura Linney was in The Truman Show, The Life of David Gale. Uh, She was in Kinsey. She's been in some pretty hip stuff. Yeah, she's a good actor, too. And she plays in this movie what I'm pretty sure is the worst lawyer ever. Yeah. But I don't know if she's supposed to be the worst lawyer ever. And, uh, you know, there's, there's stuff in the writing, and we'll get to the writing of the movie, but her closing speech is fucking awful. Our trials are not about facts. And, uh, you know, she uses the term agnostic to describe her. She's, um, she kind of makes this transition in the movie. The movie, as a movie that deals with exorcism, deals with um, spirituality, it has to, or at least it thinks it has to, talk about a spiritual character arc of someone investigating or a trial. That's it. Anytime you have a movie that's paranormal and also involves an investigation, an easy go-to character arc is... The person's not a believer, and then they slowly become a believer. Right, and so you see that, and you know, you see that in all sorts of movies of this nature. You see that kind of played with interestingly in the X Files as a serialized TV show. The dynamic between those two characters, and how or even if they evolve over the seasons of that, it's a really classic character arc for something like this. And so I feel like the movie has to put it in because it just thinks it's it needs to be there. But she goes from. I mean, she goes from a washy agnostic. She goes from a reluctant agnostic because originally when he asks if she's a Catholic, she says, no, I, I'm an agnostic. I'm not really sure. Right. She she almost tries to negate that she's really an agnostic because <laughs> she's if, not comfortable right. being an agnostic because she, I guess because she wants to be something more. Which is already the word people use when they're not yeah. comfortable with atheists, right? Exactly. When they have no theism in their life, but they want to sound like, ah, I'm not really sure I could go either way. Please don't judge me. Well, agnostic. So mm-hmm. she's a reluctant agnostic. But where does she end up at the end of the movie? Well, she gets this locket that she finds in the snow through, you know, one of those things that lets you know that your life is on the right track. Sure, uh, sure. Random coincidence. That's what it was called. So if any, but any of our listeners in Podmanity have had any random coincidences in their life lately, go ahead you and are on the right uh, track. Go ahead and don't email those to us. Do not fucking care. That falls under dream theory, but you don't even get three sentences. I don't want to But she hear gets it. a locket and ends up deciding that she has doubt or uh, angels and demons. I don't remember. One of those bad movies that, that she's Tom Hanks or Philip to. Seymour Hoffman was in. And she becomes a reluctant mystic. That's right. A reluctant washy mystic. So, I mean, that's not so compelling. But what's interesting to me is that, and what the movie tells me that it's not about, but it secretly is, is uh, she's someone who's driven by her desire to win. And she's really transparent about that, which mm-hmm. is why it interests me. Because she says to him, you know, he, when she first visits him in prison, he says, oh, are you a, a media darling? Are you here to, you know, be in the spotlight? And she simply says, I was selected because I'm comfortable with that. But really, I just want to be junior partner. And, and that she kind wants of to be senior partner, whatever, some fucking law partner. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the legal hierarchy, but it, that kind of blows him away. He he thinks, oh well, that's pretty honest. Why don't I go ahead and ask you about your religion? So they both want things out of this. He doesn't want to be found innocent. He just wants to tell the fucking story, mm-hmm. and she doesn't really give a shit about the truth. She just wants to make super partner. So we can't even talk about the demons without figuring out first, is she an awful lawyer or what's happening here? So it's difficult to gauge whether she's a bad lawyer or bad at acting like a good lawyer. Right. And so she falls in the gray area of just being a bitchy girlfriend. Right. I don't even know if it's it's um, accurate to say she's a bad actor in the role, but maybe she just has a completely different idea mm-hmm. of the role. Because if you're going to say, you know, she's the, the bad girl, girlfriend she's the the mean bitchy girlfriend then she plays that to a t yeah she does She does it really in her mannerisms in her expressions when she's in the courtroom and she turns and glares at somebody i mean she's just being a fucking jerk 
and it's very consistent. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is a, a really good example of what you see a lot in this movie where it's torn in different directions. Yeah. Jennifer Carpenter kind of thinks this is a different movie than Laura Well, Linney she never thinks. has to deal with the court. She's the only character in the film that never goes to court. She gets to right. fully exist in the testimonials and the background story of what's gone on. Everybody that goes, anybody that ends up in court except for Tom Wilkinson, is kind of a dick. Yeah, or at least we see that side of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Emily Rose is just in the flashbacks. The flashbacks are very well contained. They're trying to do a very specific thing. And then when we get to the court, things get spread out. You know, and that's one of the beauties of the movie is that it tries to weigh a couple different sides. It tries to show you different motivations and different perspectives. And, you know, we get to, uh, we should probably talk about the director and writer because yeah. we've seen them on the show oddly before. Oh my God. Um, let's call this their better effort though. Yeah, that's for sure. Because on Killapalooza, you know, we're allowed to rail against the, the poorer movies. Yeah. Or the poorer four movies. And, oh my God, that Hellraiser Killapalooza. So which one was it? This was Spirit Fingers, Hellraiser oh, no. 5, Inferno. People won't forget this one. I, we don't need to say anything about it. It was back on that Hellraiser show. Go listen to it. But the same team. So it's the director, Scott Derrickson, and Paul Boardman, who is the writer. Scott Derrickson wrote part of this with um, Paul Boardman. They kind of collaborated on that. And then Derrickson directed it. So you get this, uh, this kind of interesting dynamic because Scott Derrickson is a, a real true believer. I mean, totally buys this stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas Paul Boardman is a complete skeptic. Right. Thinks it's all fucking ridiculous. And I think it's pretty clear when you look at certain scenes who wrote what scene or, you know, when the when the directing style really embraces the supernatural as if it's actually happening. It's a lot less subtle than something we've seen like Rosemary's Baby, where it kind of had those different sides. And Roman Polanski said he wanted those to exist. I almost feel like Paul Boardman was fighting with Scott Derrickson. Yeah. Um, not necessarily a, a real legitimate fight because that collaboration was intentional and honest. But when Scott directs that, he has to direct it from the place of, sure. isn't this creepy that this really exists? Well, but that turns it into a horror movie it instead does. of a boring court drama. Right. That's why this movie looks and feels. That's why it is The Exorcism of Emily Rose, the movie that all your friends have seen. But I think Paul's scenes are just as memorable. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff like, uh, and, and Scott gives them credit, that blood dripping in the opening titles right. coming back around to the barbed wire fence what in court is called the miraculous wounds. Uh -huh. And I love that. Rather than giving those air quotes, he just throws his hands up, you know, like the wounds is probably the intention there. But I just, I think that's great. I'm just going to start throwing my hands up and waving them around suspiciously instead of using air quotes. You get all of these, you know, real creepy scenes in the flashbacks. The real creepy scenes are completely fair in that way because they're retelling the story. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to move away from the miraculous wounds explanation, we look at Jennifer Carpenter's character. We look at Emily Rose and all of this stuff that has no explanation that's happening to her. We see her body contort. We see her alone in the room getting fucked by the devil. And you think, all right, so the movie is telling me the supernatural is exist, demons exist, and they're clearly possessing her. But that's just the retelling in court. Right. They're showing the dramatization, really, sure. of, uh, of what's going on. And when you get back to the courtroom, and this is what I love, is, you know, after getting these insanely scary episodes, they then explain them in court. And it almost seems like they make you feel like a fool for believing these. Yeah. You know, you you have the scene where she flips out and runs to the church mm -hmm. and it reshows that scene, a fight club style, mm -hmm. right? Where she walks by everybody and they're not making a scary face and she's just being a fucking nut yeah. job. Or the one I really like is when, you know, they show all the foreign languages. And that yeah. starts to seem like the movie even treats that as a climax. Uh -huh. That's one of the scariest Well, that's when parts. you kind of realize, oh, there's a lot of demons possessing her and right. one of them is the devil. It's the point where you go, oh my God, this is the devil himself. We are in over our heads. Yeah. And they cut back to court and then they just explain that she knew a lot of foreign languages. Yeah. She went to, she went to a, a Catholic school that t happened to teach all the languages that she was speaking. Right. And right. she's religious. So she knows all the religious background. And this is, I mean, this is true skeptic material here. You see this so often in these cases that come up because uh, while this is, um, you know, only based on one particular case, there's tons of these. I mean, even even modern day ones where someone has gone to court or some sort of legal cases raised against somebody who led to the death of somebody else via their fucking witch science. Sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, they said, use this miracle cure instead of this doctor 
or, you know, hey, let's all tie down this person and beat the demons out of them. Sure. And then they die. And... Try acupuncture, try homeopathic therapy, any right. of this stuff. Well, I'm even thinking of specific cases where people were brutalized over it. Uh, the you, witch trials? You know, in the last couple of years, there's been more than I even want to think humanity is capable of, where people just tried to beat demons out of each other. You know, and, if uh, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, that's the law they violated. And for that law, you can be found guilty and apparently walk. So maybe people argue with me on that, but I feel like it shows that skeptical angle. Yeah, I feel like sure. that's the whole point of having, even at a high concept level, right? You're yeah. showing a, a court case. Yeah, you show the court case, and the other thing that's really that they do a really decent job of doing is making the prosecutor a man of faith. Yeah. I mean, they could make the prosecutor an asshole skeptic, and yeah, of course he's going to find explanations, but this guy believes in the basis of the situation. Right. He th- he sees the facts, the evidence of this sure, particular sure. circumstance and can step back from his faith and go, he says it. He says, this is about facts. It's not about, you know, speculation or things of faith. And sure. unfortunately, you know, that apparently isn't what the court case is about, as we're told, and eventually find out through the uh, spectacular judgment in the uh, trial. But, you know, fuck that. Well, there comes that point where she wants to change their defense. And so she wants to use the, oh, actually, it is demons defense. And I thought that was going to be insane. Well, I thought that's the worst thing you could do. Yeah, it's, it's, less, it's less, no, it actually is demons. And it's, are demons really that unbelievable? Right, or, maybe, right. or maybe something more along the lines of, whether it's demons or not doesn't matter. It turns out these people believe in demons. Sure. And so when that angle comes in, that's where it starts to be more interesting for me. I uh, I can't remember an instant where my guard was up so much to go, oh, wait till you use that defense. You're going to sound like a fucking fool. And then she says it, and it works surprisingly well. Because it's not, uh, it's not you have to believe. She addresses us specifically mm-hmm. in the audience. She says, you think I'm foolish for talking about demons. She even chuckles a little bit at mm-hmm. it, which is great. I mean, again, to, to kind of go back and credit the actor for different little pieces of that, she laughs at the, the demons. And she says, you don't have to believe in demons. All you have to believe is that these people believed, the priests, the family, and Emily, and they tried to do what they thought was best in that situation, which doesn't make this a conversation about the supernatural Mm -hmm. or about science or about backing science or even facts. It makes it a conversation about freedom, which personally for me becomes a lot harder. I mean, where is the line? You yourself are something of a nut job libertarian. I think we identify on a lot of that stuff. Uh, where do, where is that line drawn? If people all decide collectively to, uh, I don't know, engage in some kind of BDSM behavior, mm-hmm. and one of them accidentally dies, that's certainly a lot different than a mugging, yeah. because they all have this mutual consent. There we're dealing with a death, it's obviously not the intention, but what if we have some kind of group of people that, you know, they want to commit suicide? I mean, is that, you see where that's kind of a gray area? Yeah, well, should kind they, of. Should, I mean, should it be illegal for them to do that? Suicide for me is, it's, that's an even deeper subject than, you know, I guess what, what would you call it? Involuntary manslaughter? Right, right. There are, the, re, the court system is designed to kind of accommodate for something like that. Mm-hmm. Something, like you said, in the BDSM situation where somebody gets their ass whipped to death they would not be charged with first-degree murder or voluntary manslaughter. There is a court charge for somebody who killed somebody and they didn't mean to. Let me ask you this then. Would you put assisted suicide in a different camp than people who believe in crazy ghost shit and one of them, you know, kills the other? Yeah, well, I think in that situation, you're killing somebody. You're Mm -hmm. intentionally ending somebody's life. Right. In crazy ghost shit, in, you know, beating people with college paddles, You're not intentionally killing somebody. Death is not the intended result. Sure. Think once you go into a situation knowing you're going to kill somebody, that it becomes an entirely different situation ethically. Yeah, I guess for me, the intentions are so irrelevant because the movie makes it about intentions too. But I think, you know, some of the the worst evils, atrocities committed on planet fucking Earth were done with the best of intentions. Mm. Intentions doesn't say a whole lot to me. And that's always kind of where I felt involuntary was. But maybe that's you know, on a case-by-case basis, important. Uh, When I think of these things, and I think of a lot of the real-life scenarios, I'm always a bit torn if someone as a a participant, as a client, goes to someone who is a pseudoscientist purporting some kind of cure. Both of them have a mutual agreement that they're going to, you know, partake in this. 
And there becomes the question of, is the person practicing the pseudoscience, should they be held responsible for any wrongdoing for the person who came to them, you know, for that very thing? And in Emily's case, it's, you know, it's a little more clear cut because she's deranged. And then you're just putting someone who's deranged in danger. Right. You know, they need a guardian. She need, her parents are her guardians at that point. It wouldn't be any different than, say, you know, not getting your kid vaccinated. Right. Well, and the, there's the one specialist that they call in that says, you know, I, electroshock therapy, and that's supposed to be a big no-no. Right. But he says, you know, to save her life, yeah, I would do that against her will because sure. she's clearly in a situation where she can't make provisional decisions for herself. Right. They almost act as if that's a win for the defense. Yeah. And I feel like when you really think about it, that just shows the other side. Mm-hmm. That just shows that sometimes people don't know, you know, what is the best, what's for their own good. Well, it's just, you know, it's a two-year-old sticking a fork in the outlet. Sure. If the two-year-old sticks a fork in the outlet, the parent can't go, ooh, I hope you don't die. Right. Because, uh, you know, you're doing what you want to do. Yeah, I guess as a, an overall philosophy, I always worry about trying to protect people from themselves because I don't think we should do that. But if we're shown that a person is completely mentally unstable, they well, I can't... think if we're shown that a person needs somebody to look out for them, right? I don't know even if just to do things stability... like eat, right? Yeah. Then they need caretakers, they need guardians, and it's the the duty of those people to protect them. She's not any different than that child mm-hmm. in that circumstance. So intentions are irrelevant. The trial's about actions. That's what it should be about. I'm happy leaving it there. Yeah. A different kind of uncomfortable question might come in the form of, I don't know, the next movie we're doing yeah, on the show. Yeah, I would definitely say so. It comes right at the beginning. Um, and that is how to pronounce Mila's name. Yeah, right. You were, you were really upset I'm in a grumpy this. mood, but but you kind of pissed me off because you rewound the film three times. and we had Oh, it pre- was far more than three. We I had, really put you that's through it. probably true. But we had previously discussed that I was afraid that you were just belittling the film down to the most important part of this film is the pronunciation of this actress's name. Oh, come on. Give me a little more credit than well, that. Well, like I said, I was grumpy. What and, you need to I know was... is that diction and proper grammar and pronunciation is important to me as someone who never gets that right. Right, and who also hosts what apparently is called a podcast. You don't have to get the emails when I have to deal That's with true. this That's true. You, f- you do me the honor of forwarding all the nice emails and going, you know, you like text me, hey, check out this cool thing someone said on Facebook. But this giant stack of Terry Gilliam emails we're still getting after 149 shows yeah. leave us alone. It's a hard G. It's... Mila Jovovich. Mila Jovovich. We had the last name right forever. I think so, although now I'm starting to question that. She says her own name. This is a this is a big fucking moment for me. An actor, I don't understand how to pronounce their name. It's very crazy. Mm-hmm. It's got lots of odd letters in it, and they pronounce it for me in a film. Okay, right. and, moving and, on. And well, the thing about the film is that it no other film allows for this kind of dynamic for an actor to pronounce their name. Sure. Because sure. in this film, she is... Mila Jovovich as the doctor. It's true. Already we're setting up the layers. So you can lower your defenses on this one. Mm -hmm. I'm totally with you. I'm with you 100% on this. And that's the only reason this shows up on Double Feature, because unless it's The Room and The Happening, we're not going to talk about movies that suck. Maybe if they go in a, a Killapalooza. I think this movie offers a lot of stuff, and I think that... The internet especially fucking despises yeah, it. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. All right, so then our job becomes, well, what the fuck, guys? Why should I care about mm-hmm. the fourth kind? And I think we got a pretty big list. Yeah. It does things other movies don't do. Yeah. It does something interesting that stands out. Whether that thing works or not, never the uh, the reason to talk about it. Uh-huh. The reason to talk about it is to get to the answer sure. to that question. Right. If you decide that thing doesn't work, the movie doesn't vanish. It's a movie that performed... The, I, it keeps going back to that science thing, man. Mm-hmm. We perform the experiment. We're interested in the experiment. You don't throw the experiment out if the results didn't work. And I'm not even going to say the results don't work. Yeah. The internet's going to say the results don't work. Well, but fuck that. You should still consider I the think, experiment, no, right? No, I think what the internet is going to say is you didn't tell me I was part of an experiment. That's Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's just it wasn't ready for that. I think the internet thinks it's the butt end of a joke. And the internet does not like to be the butt end of a joke. Um, all right. So first and foremost, Mila's name was very important. The other mm-hmm. important thing, I fucking love Alaska. 
So Alaska, perfect setting for this movie because we know nothing about yeah, Alaska. Alaska's huge. It's empty. There's a there's a city in Alaska that can only be reached by plane. Right. There's a large portion of Alaska that can only be reached by plane, which is pretty amazing. And everything looks pretty and completely detached from everything else. So this is part of the United States. We don't, you know, in order to set the uh, the mood of this movie, mm-hmm. we don't need to move all the way to a remote village somewhere Siberia. that we've never. Yeah, we don't need to do the Cannibal Holocaust thing mm-hmm. to go to a place no one's ever been before. We can just go to fucking Alaska. Everyone still speaks English. We don't have to talk about the culture at all. We just tell a story. A Canadians story that get can, it. Yeah, Canadians do get it. We can tell a story that can only be told in a remote place, but it's still in the United States. And that's part of the appeal to me of, I just love setting things in Alaska. I loved Insomnia. I love Bright Falls, even though that's, you know, Washington or wherever the fuck. It's Alaska. I guess it's set in Bright Falls, right? The name is the place that it's in. But it's got this Twin Peaks vibe to it. Mm -hmm. Not Bright Falls. That does too. But the fourth kind. You're in these, uh, these isolated little lodges and owls are not what they seem which we should talk about we'll yes. get to that too there's also a story to the fourth yeah kind. there's a whole thing that people kind of forget about and i i mean we should talk about that the sort of creation myth that's yeah, going on. the right. real the real story the, yeah that's uh that's under everything why things are going on i mean you know we have the the story on the top level Will Patton doesn't give a goddamn about the ether, which, yeah. by the way, is Will Patton in this movie. Will Patton owns this movie. It's a great place to, you just plant a character like Will Patton here. All of this insane alien shit that doesn't actually happen in real life can be going on in the movie. Mm-hmm. The movie can even tell you, hey, insane alien shit happens in real life all the time. And as long as Will Patton is there to tell you that he doesn't care about the goddamn ether, then everything's fine. Let's just follow him around. Yeah, well, ab- eventually what it boils down to is these three characters. There's mm-hmm. Will Patton's character who plays August, Mm -hmm. Elias Cotillas, who we saw in The Prophecy. Yeah. He plays uh, her friend Mm -hmm. who comes in. And then there's Mila Jovovich. And each of them, Will Patton plays the hard, nothing like this ever happens. I don't care. Don't talk to me about it. We are saving lives. Yeah, right. Then Elias Cotillas kind of plays the, I've seen all this happen. I don't believe that it's happening. Yeah, which then, is kind of a strange role. You right. don't figure out what's going on with that role till the and end then, of the movie. Exactly. And then Mila Jovovich plays the, I didn't see the end of the movie, so I don't yeah, know what's... Right. I think all this is real. And we should have kind of a heads up in the beginning, because when we see the actor who plays the real version of the fake person we see, mm-hmm. wow, that needs some unpacking, huh? Um, when we see... Dr. Abigail Tyler. Right. The, um, you know, the Chapman University footage. Right. Who is played by Charlotte uh, Milchard, right? Yeah, she's credited as, yeah. as a a gnome resident yeah. in the yeah, and she's she's really singled out in the credits too, right? As gnome resident, which it, it turns out she plays Doctor Abigail Tyler, mm-hmm. but she looks fucking batty, yeah. And uh, and so we start to think maybe it's just because she's a victim, right? But as the movie goes on, we go, oh wait, the movie's been telling us the whole time she's fucking batty. Yeah, well, that's and- fine. And the other thing that's really cool about the dynamic with the Chapman University interview with the director, Olatunde Osinsanmi. Right, is, who plays the interviewer who is also right. the director of the I film. I love that they put the director in the movie to kind of right. cr- to, to solidify the la- the truth layer. I'm, right. I'm using air, air palms here. Thank you for those palms. Um, to solidify that layer, they throw the director who the audience, as far as they know, is a real dude. Yeah. So immediately the director's in this. So this must be factual because yep. that's a that's the director of the film. He does not exist in any false universe. Unlike sure. Mila Jovovich, who clearly exists in a false universe because she's an actor. Directors can't act. And suddenly we've all been fooled. All right. So we'll get to the hoax stuff because mm-hmm. everybody wants to bitch about the hoax stuff and we'll talk about it. But uh, before we completely miss out on what's going on in the movie yeah. as the entire conversation. This is uh, this is why I wanted to do the fourth kind. Mm-hmm. Everybody talks about the fucking hoax. No one talks about what's happening in the movie. I didn't even know what was happening in the movie until talking to you yeah. about it. Because every time I see it, I keep thinking about the hoax because that right. interests me. That's the right. appealing part. That's the catch. So what is up with the owls? The owls are not what they seem. Ha ha, Twin Peaks reference number two. Yeah, well, see, the thing is, is everybody's kind of looking at the movie for face value. They're taking it as... Everything's going to be spelled out. There's clearly a true story in the dramatization. 
the film seems originally to go, the aliens are fucking with people. That's no good. Yeah, but right. the reality of the situation is there is a whole storyline going on. Mm-hmm. It's all explained. What's going on, why they're there, what they're doing, who they are, how long they've been there. That's yeah. all in the movie. You have to be paying attention. Sure. Essentially, what goes on in the film? Here, I'll, I'll spark note it in maybe three sentences. Let's, let's call this a dream. You can try this at home. You can uh, go through the movie and know that it is all fiction. Right. And then just try paying attention to what fucking happens. But sorry, go ahead. So essentially what happens is, one, the owls are never there. There are no owls. So there's movie. not. you're not walking around seeing owls all no. the time? No. Okay. The, the owls are planted in people's memories to replace the memories of the aliens like drilling into their shoulder. Okay, so it's owl filler. Exactly. The aliens have gone, uh, we can't put those memories there. Shit, what do we do? I don't know, owls. Yeah, exactly. All right, so, that's fine. That's and, great. And I speculated that maybe that's kind of like a, hmm, owls are semi-rare, so maybe the audience will go, oh, I've seen an owl. Maybe I never saw an owl. Yeah, right. But the other part of the film that's clearly more interesting has to do with the Sumerian language thing, which is explained kind of roughly as aliens put people here, we created people, we're here to just kind of watch them. And we'll eventually destroy them later on. So this is a part of the movie that I think is really awesome and underappreciated. Because this is a different type of creation myth. And unlike when we were talking about Emily Rose, this is something that's actually possible. Not in the sense that we're given in the movie. Not in the way that in modern day Earth, aliens are visiting people and the government's covering it up and the FBI's been there 2,000 plus times. But rather in the way that when you... um. You know, we've talked about Richard Dawkins a lot on the mm-hmm. show, and uh, he's speculated in his writing, or at least entertained the the possibility, let's say, uh, talking about how vastly superior technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I believe Richard Dawkins goes on to kind of uh, kind of twist that and talk about how you know God would be indistinguishable in that same way, how we could have a super advanced alien life, something I know Michael Shermer's written about mm-hmm. as well, and the alien life could have started the universe. It could have been the thing that started evolution down its path and then disappeared back into space. And to us, our notion of God as a society wouldn't be a whole lot different from had aliens just created society. Right, exactly. And in a way that's blasphemy because it doesn't reserve God to its special magical place Mm -hmm. where you, you know, where the Bible puts it. But something started life here and it's not completely mystical to think you know, as one in a giant spectrum of possibilities, that could have been some sort of alien. I mean, right. this is more of a thought experiment sure. than to say scientists, this is what scientists actually right. believe. Well, and the other thing the film does is that it, instead of instead of doing what is kind of the Stargate thing, which mm-hmm. is aliens came down and nudged people in a certain direction, Fourth Kind says, aliens are God. The line, I am God, appears right. in the terrifying Abby Tyler possession at the end. Uh, that's the scariest shit. Sure, sure. For, for me, mm-hmm. I think that is one of the scariest moments in cinema. Mm-hmm. But he's, the alien creator, Sumerian dude, says, I am God. And he goes ahead and blends aliens, God, same thing. Let's right. send the FBI in to investigate God. So this is the scene where the aliens confirm it. They have created humanity. Mm-hmm. This is something for them to, it's an experiment for them. And now they're coming back to maybe end that experiment. And that's where the horror comes in. That's where the visitations come in. They're not just fucking with society. This almost explains the alien mythos as well. Mm -hmm. Why would aliens come and fuck with society? And we have um, all of these, you know, fictitious anecdotes about how people have been visited by aliens in the night. And it's just to be fucked with. And so this movie postulates perhaps that the aliens created society that we've seen them, you know, throughout throughout things that you see in museums. You can go to any museum and see this. And uh, because I've been to lots of museums that have alien spaceships just, you know, written into their hieroglyphics. Mm-hmm. The movie's written a story where the aliens created us and now they are done with their experiment. And in a nutshell, I think that's kind of the mythos here. Mm-hmm. What people get hung up on rather than the skeptical idea of aliens being indistinguishable from God and um and setting up a a fictional story you know about that people instead get hung up on the hoax and a lot of that comes from the opening of the movie where you have you know an actor come up to the screen and tell you she's an actor in a movie that is completely true Mm -hmm. it seems like not a week goes by where we don't make fun of movies that say they're based on a true story turns out every film is based on a true story go figure people write the movies they draw facts from their own realities into the movies actors bring things with them 
If a movie isn't based, at least in part, on some sort of reality, it becomes completely absurd. And even movies that then go and perform that very experiment, that go on the completely absurd, they are grounded in some kind of reality. Even if your film's a documentary or a complete dramatization attempting to be you know, completely accurate, even if they change the names, if you go all the way down then to these are inspired by real events or something real happened somewhere... I mean, that's why, you know, at the end of the credits where we say none of these things are based in fact, please don't sue us. I mean, that always seemed nuts to me. That doesn't make any Mm -hmm. sense. But this movie basically just lies to you. That's what it does. And I think everybody's aware of that. But it should probably be said at some point in this conversation. The movie says, hey, this really happens. This, in fact, this very story we're telling you really happened. And the story turns out didn't really happen. Well, I think what the film does is, and I think this is a good thing. I think this is a very strong move for the film is imagine you go into a theater, right? Mm-hmm. You pay $400 for your movie ticket. Yeah, okay. And you sit down and you think to yourself, I'm going to see a movie. The first thing the movie does is says this isn't a movie. It immediately betrays your initial expectation and you no longer are able to grasp the film as pure fiction. Right, right. Because it immediately disrupts the one thing you thought you were going to do. <laughs> right, the one preconception you had. Even if you're the person who doesn't watch any trailers mm-hmm. and you go in and see the movie, and the movie says, mm, turns out this is all fact. I mean, what is a movie if not something that's just going to lie to you for an hour yeah, and a half exactly. anyways? So it might as well start lying before the movie even truly begins. So if you haven't figured it out by now, of course the movie's not real. Yeah. But I think anybody who's even... The small, anybody who would subscribe to a film podcast mm-hmm. knows that this movie isn't real. Yeah, you have to. You know it by the way that the, you know it by the acting uh-huh. in the, this is not acting, but right. it obviously is acting scenes. Sure. You know it by that, uh, that Chapman University footage, but you would also have to believe then if you were to be fooled by this film, you would have to believe that the Chapman University stuff was real footage, but also that the actual audio was actually audio. Right. That camera pan at the end of the yeah. Chapman University, the dramatic pan out to reveal sure. the wheelchair, that reveal also uh-huh. happened in their footage. You'd have, to, you'd have to believe that there was pretty fucking insane real video footage of human levitation and a UFO that didn't right. get thrust onto YouTube. Yeah, exactly. That that somehow didn't get on there first. And even in Nome, Alaska, they have goddamn internet connections. Well, the one thing in Nome, Alaska that you, you can't really expect that they're going to have is a quick government cover-up if some podunk gnome alaska cop catches a ufo on his police camera right he's going to put it somewhere where people can see it far and away before washington dc can travel the thousands of miles to gnome alaska well and then there's the whole section talking about you can go to any museum and see spaceships Mm -hmm. and aliens and while i'm sure the movie's idea was that you could go there and squint and say wow that kind of looks like a spaceship you're not going to find any acrylics sitting next to them, any any plaques that say, and here we see the first spaceship ever drawn by Egyptians. Right, exactly. You won't even find anything that fucking says, and some people think this might be the first space. No right, one's going to say exactly. that because it's not the fucking first spaceship. That's that, that's so illogical. Well, the only people that would say that is somebody that, have, that sees their husband's suicide as a murder being stabbed in the chest. Right. So the movie is even being more skeptical than anyone's asking. Yeah, it's being more skeptical than apparently the entire internet audience right the movie's then playing roger ebert himself they're playing a trick on you mm-hmm. they're purporting a hoax in the same way that the blair witch project did. sure they're just not doing it outside the cinema as much as inside you know there was viral stuff that was kind of thrown up about it and like this whole lawsuit boring thing that i don't want to get into but uh they credit the actors right in the fucking movie you know instead of the director coming out and trying to say this was real footage the director says it inside his own movie. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you believe what you want to believe and, and makes the bookends. Perhaps even the first worthwhile, we've maybe answered that question now, the first yeah. worthwhile bookends. So I start to wonder, is anyone fooled? The kind of people who think about the lighting in film or the camera work or how a film weaves a narrative, they're not going to be fooled. Mm-hmm. The people who listen to the show, probably not going to be fooled. Although, double feature show at gmail.com if... You're the movie off. totally fooled you and you were mad that you had a prank pulled on you. But I start to wonder then, let's pretend that some people were fooled, right? Some people uh-huh. left this movie with an idea of reality that was anything other than what it should be. And no internet access. So does the film then have an obligation to represent the truth at all? 
You know, I I don't think that the film has to do anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that going into the film, it tells you what it's going to do. It tells you how it's going to do it. And by the end, it's they they say, you know, it's yours to decide. It's your call. How you want to take the film is up to you. This is how the film has been made. This is the, it at least uh, raises that question. You yeah. think that's enough for it? it? It basically says this is the experiment. You can choose to believe, you know, whatever you want. But it's the same thing as, say, let's go back to the previous film. It's the same thing as Exorcism of Emily Rose, right? right. Where you essentially by the end of any exorcism film, it's saying this is just one story. Maybe it happened. What do you think? Do you think exorcisms right. are real? Sure, sure. Every film asks that question. This film goes ahead and does it on the actual tape. Yeah, it's funny because the thing that garnered controversy, the thing that made people upset, isn't any of the new stuff this movie is doing. It's the same old shit the movie's doing. Yeah. Where it's, you know, it's feeding into the movie's propagating alien paranoia. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what makes people mad. But you see this question come up in magic all the time. When someone goes out and does a show, you know, they do the Uri Geller thing and they say, I can actually bend spoons or they do the Penn and Teller thing. And, you know, Penn and Teller have gone uh, gone through great lengths to omit any distortion of reality from their show, not to the point where they come out and say, good evening, everything you're going to be seeing is a trick. But they have a lot of uh, pieces that, I mean, really venture into art world mm -hmm. in making the audience question the nature of a trick and of a show and in paying to go to be lied to, you know, to question magic as a whole. Uh, you see the same thing pop up with, I love that I can bring my dorky knowledge of magic over to a conversation where this might actually be relevant. About but this aliens. conversation, yeah, about aliens. This conversation comes up all the time. Do you have to start every magic show saying, everything I'm going to do is a trick? And of course, the answer to that question is trying to provoke is we'll know that that's, you know, uh -huh. that's too much. The next question that sort of naturally springs from that is, would that ruin your time? If someone said, all right, we're going to mutually agree to be lied to, some people think there is a, definitely a certain camp of people that think that ruins, you know, that mutual, that handshake mm -hmm. you have, that rules the mutual agreement to be fooled. Yeah. If once you're on stage, you're already talking about being fooled. It's not letting that unfold. Sure. It would be the same as if, you know, during a play, people came out and said, all right, this play is going to be portrayed by actors. And that, in fact, is often the argument made against that. You know, people know when they go to see magic that it's a bunch of bullshit. Uh, sometimes they don't know that. And that's where you get into where people think David Blaine has secret powers mm -hmm. that he can't tell anybody about. But then you can go all the way to the opposite end of the spectrum, which is clearly, I would say, not okay, where magicians say, you know what, I really do have these powers mm -hmm. and I can really do that stuff. And they're trying to distort people's idea of reality outside of the stage. And you have stuff that falls in the middle. Um, uncomfortable lines like neuro linguistic programming, for instance, there's a whole variety of that stuff. If we're to look then at movies and consider that medium, I mean, movies have been responsible for lying to us for a very long That's time. That's pretty much all they do. When you look at exorcism, that was a great example, but even this is aliens. It's a perfect example the entire public paranoia of aliens exists almost exclusively because of movies, mm -hmm. because of Close Encounters of the Third Kind and of the fucking Independence well, Day shit that came out in the 90s. Aliens is one of the most fantastic examples of media perpetrating paranoia because people didn't... Aliens wasn't a widely known thing until pulp sci-fi in the 60s and sure. 70s. I mean, before then, I guess Earth versus the Flying Saucers in the 50s. But the thing is, is media perpetuated the existence of aliens, and for some reason, people kind of just assume that was real. And the other movies don't start and end with, this was something that actually happened. But I think the fourth kind, rather than trying to make any statement about the reality of aliens, uh, or even if it is trying to do that, what it does instead is further the portrayal of aliens throughout movie history. Rather than look at this from the skeptical side of things and say, well, is this movie doing something wrong because more people leave the theater and think aliens might exist? Which is a fair question to be asked. This is a direct comparison to the magic stuff. Mm -hmm. There are always going to be these places along you know, the gradient of okay to totally not okay. And that's for people to make up their own minds on, as of course the film says they should. But this is one way of doing that. This is one way of saying... Throughout time, movies have been the thing that is leading this alien paranoia. Movies are where we get our concepts of what an alien is. And I'm going to give my audience enough credit 
to not, you know, have them leaving the theater thinking this movie's trying to make some statement about, you know, as an alien documentary. That's why there's a, a there's a dramatic portion at all. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it would just be a fucking fake documentary, right? Sure. It would just be saying aliens are totally real. It would be one of these hoax clips that does show up on YouTube. Right. I mean, I think that stuff should be a lot more, you know, that's a lot more demonstrable to me than a film that you go to see in a theater. I guess that's why I come come away on that side mm-hmm. of the argument. Because while there might be people that left the theater believing in aliens, believing that people are visited by aliens when people actually aren't visited by aliens, and that might offend a, a very logical side of me. You know, if you do even the slightest research, it's completely disproven. The only reason people would walk away from the fourth kind believing in aliens is because they want to. Exactly. Because they won't perform a simple Google search. Because, you know, it's the completely gullible who are going to be misled by that. And I don't know if it's the responsibility of art to prevent gullible people from being misled. If you make a compelling film, it's going to automatically do that, is it not? Yeah, well, the thing is, and this will probably be the last thing I say, not only on the show today, but about Roger Ebert in my life until we do Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, is that Roger Ebert, his big criticism about the film was that he was bummed that it was (laughs) fictitious. Yeah. If that is the core problem with the film is that everybody was pissed off that there weren't really aliens terrorizing these people, wake the fuck up. There aren't aliens terrorizing people. If a film makes you think there are for an hour and a half, that film wins. We have a website, doublefeatureshow.com, and in fact, an email address, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. This is definitely one of those shows where I'd love people's feedback. Yeah. Because we have these really strong opinions, and we come out here and we make them sound like facts as we do Mm -hmm. every week. Yeah. But that's just kind of the way we talk. We could be completely wrong. I think we're pretty humble about that stuff. So you know what? If you think we totally have the wrong side of this, send us a fucking email and maybe you're right. But without hearing those voices, that's never going to happen. And we're going to continue going on here and telling everybody that we speak the gospel. Yeah, we're going to just keep watching movies and talking about them like we have any idea what we're doing. And oh my God, is that going to happen next time on the show? So uh, people can still donate, and that's going to be just for a couple more weeks. That's donate.doublefeatureshow.com, and that's how you can pick out some of the movies we're going to watch. We've been talking about that like every other goddamn week Mm -hmm. for a long time, so I'm sure people know all the details there. But we're going to pick two people who've donated since we started doing this. We're going to email them. They're going to email us some films, and we're going to pair them up and do them at the end of the year. If you do the subscribe on that side I just mentioned, then also your voice is going to go at the beginning of the show in that music intro you probably skip through every time. Next time on the show, it's big number 150, Mm -hmm. and uh, I don't really know if there's a good reason to have paired these two movies, but, you know, we've been doing, we do these fucking production meetings uh, every once in a while, and we try and figure out all the shows for the year and whatever, and we've been trying to do Lost Highway literally since we did the last David Lynch movie, Mm -hmm. and it's hard because you haven't seen Lost Highway, and our producer's fucking useless, and I keep reaching out on our Facebook page, oh, that's good, by the way, tie that in. Facebook page is something you... I don't even know the address. It's Facebook.something.somethingelse.zuckerberg. Run a search for Double Feature on Facebook and add that to your shit. Uh, I go on there every once in a while and I say, Hey, Lost Highway, we still want to do that. What should we do it with? Blade Runner. People give Blade these, Runner. Blade Runner. <laughs> people give Blade Runner. awful fucking suggestions. So uh, here's what I think we should do. I want to do it with Psycho. Here's my rationale on that. Aren't you going to boo or hiss or something? I I was going to wait for your rationale and then tell you watch more fucking film, but rationale first, please. Okay. So we have the, um, we have David Lynch, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, for me, this has been much an inverse of year one where you were showing me all these horror films. I'm now trying to get you on this David Lynch bandwagon a bit. And I initially, I didn't give a shit, but you actually liked Blue Velvet. I love Blue Velvet. I own Blue Velvet. And so I thought, Hey, you know, we're going to venture into some, some bizarre territory and shit's going to stop making sense, and I don't have the answers. Mm-hmm. So Lost Highway is one of the next logical jumps. It, uh, it would be the next logical jump for our show, because it makes a little less sense, but still mostly sense. So I want to do it with something, but it's really fucking long, and I don't know. I, it just, I don't know how to pair it. So I'm going to pair it with something that's really wrong. I want to do it with Psycho, and I'm going to take the burden here when next week we show up, and people spent seven hours watching these two movies back to back, and they're all mad at me, and the show doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. So unlike usually where I'll try and throw that on you, 
Amelie and Martyrs. Still mad at you about that show? <laughs> um, I'm getting over Martyrs. I think this time it's all me and it's going to be my fault. But let's talk about Hitchcock. Great. Because there's a lot of good Hitchcock movies and we never get to discuss them because we have to start talking about Hitchcock somewhere mm-hmm. and that's kind of uncomfortable because it's hard. And Yeah. But that would be perfect for our show because we're trying to move into challenging territory. If you haven't noticed this year with all the weird fucking shows we've done. And Hitchcock is one of those things that the movies are actually good, but they're not accessible. Right. The common person can't just go watch a Hitchcock movie without feeling like there's a bunch of stuff they're missing. It's inaccessible. Who do you talk to it about? So I think who you talk to it about is these two idiots. Yeah, that's right. Watch more fucking film. Bye.